morning to all. Thank you so much for joining us for the second day of Conrad's uh, Asia annual conference. Uh, since I see many familiar faces, I won't uh, speak long this morning. We had our uh, opening remarks yesterday. Uh, but once again, I do just want to extend a, a great thanks to everybody who's been instrumental in this conference, our uh, entire CONAR staff, the staff of the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, and its director, Peter Rolberg, and then especially Carnegie Corporation of New York, <laughs> Representative Dion Arsenian, who's with us today as well. Uh, thank you all for your support, helping put together a terrific conference. We have three uh, fantastic panels uh, today. We will begin uh, with the with part three of the of, of the Ukraine uh, set of, of panels today, uh, with two uh, panels on looking at two so two sides in the timeline of, of the of the Ukraine conflict and its consequences. We'll begin with uh, Lise Giuliano from Columbia University. We'll be looking at the origins of separatism popular grievances in Donetsk and Luhansk. And each of our uh, two panels will have about 12 to 15 minutes for their comments. Thank you. Please. What are the origins of separatism in the Donbass? When Luhansk People's Republic and the <coughs> When the Luhansk People's Republic and the People's Republic of Donetsk were first proclaimed in early April 2014, their provenance was unclear, to put it mildly. The organizations they were represented before 2014 were extremely marginal in local politics, as these pictures from 2011 and 2013 indicate. This is a picture of a rally held by the pro-Russia bloc, and this is a rally from the fall of 2013. And yet, support for separatism in Donbass and for the DNR and LNR grew. By the time armed militants began taking over regional government buildings in Donetsk in early April, large crowds accompanied them. To be sure, only a minority of the general population supported the building takeovers. But by spring and early summer, popular support for the DNR and LNR reached approximately one-third of the population. So why did a significant minority of the Donbass population back separatism? And why were Donetsk and Luhansk more separatist than other regions of Ukraine? Understanding the sources of popular alienation from Kiev can help us understand the phenomena of protest mobilization, support for separatism, and is also obviously of critical importance to Ukraine if it hopes to eventually reintegrate the Donbass. In order to identify why people in Donetsk and Luhansk began supporting separatism, I created a database that includes a timeline of demonstrations held there. First, the so-called anti-Maidan rallies, and then the pro-Russian rallies that took place from late 2013 to early 2014. And I recorded themes articulated in the statements of demonstration participants using a combination of Western, Ukrainian, and Russian media reports and videos. So the first, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the first compilation of protest themes I grouped together before the removal of Yanukovych and the second after the removal of Yanukovych. And you can see it ends in early April. DNR and LNR supporters have commonly been labeled pro-Russian. And protesters often chanted Russia and held Russian flags. In fact, being pro-Russia could be considered the master narrative of this protest period if it could be said to have a master narrative. So this raises the question of whether the pro-Russia position of many protesters was a constant, whether it was due to some enduring orientation to Russia based on ethnicity or linguistic identity or geopolitical orientation, or whether the pro-Russia position was a product of recent events. The fact that DNR supporters and even and, and LNR um, leaders, when they found themselves suddenly in power, were not united on whether Donbass should join Russia, suggests that the motivation for separatism may be more complicated. Political loyalty to Russia can account for a portion of the support for DNR and LNR, especially among many in the older generation who never accepted the USSR's collapse, who exhibited a strong sense of nostalgia for the Soviet Union, and who identified Russia with the Soviet Union. However, my research found that this is only part of the story. For many citizens in Donbass, Support for separatism, I argue, was motivated by first, various kinds of material interest, and second, by a sense of betrayal 
by Kia or the rest of Ukraine, inspired by certain aspects of Maidan. So in terms of material interest, people articulated two kinds of grievances. First, claims of discrimi discriminatory redistribution. And second, perceptions of <clears throat> e the EU membership's negative effect on economic welfare due to either austerity measures or to foregoing trade with Russia and the European Customs Union. And I'll give examples in a second. Next, the events of the Maidan generated a relatively sudden and deep sense of alienation among many residents in Donetsk and Luhansk. And I argue that specific aspects of Maidan provoked a sense of betrayal by Kiev, namely the condemnation of Berkut, many of whom came from Donbass. Second, the message conveyed by the new Ukrainian parliament's attempt to annul the, la the law on Russian language. And third, the new government's a failure to repudiate the Ukrainian nationalist far right. So let me offer a few examples. First, claims of discriminatory redistribution within Ukraine. Like the striking minor, miners in the East in 1993 who complained that Donbass subsidized Ukraine's poorer regions and received little investment in return, some residents in 2014 believed that as the industrial heart of Ukraine, their region contributed more to the budget, more than their fair share to the federal budget. And this belief, of course, is widely expressed in separatist movements around the world and was common to most of the post-Soviet uh, nationalist and regionalist movements in the early 90s. So these two quotes um, give a sense of that, uh, are, are just two examples of that expression. Um, okay, I have, I have a different one written down. There are many examples of it. So by 2014, of course, Donbass was not, con not contributing as much to the federal budget as it, earlier, as it had earlier, and instead received significant subsidies from Kiev but in separatist movements, perceptions of economic conditions rather than actual conditions are what matter in motivating people, um, people who understand their region as a victim. And in Donbass, many people perceive their region to be a victim of unfair redistribution, giving rise to a sense of estrangement from the rest of the country. So the customs union. Support for the customs union and opposition to the EU, obviously the issue that sparked the Maidan protests, were frequently heard at demonstrations and large majorities in Donetsk and Luhansk favored joining uh, the, custom, the customs union over the EU. <clears throat> These percentages are significantly higher than in, in Donetsk and Luhansk than in the neighboring regions in Ukraine's east and south. Some residents, especially those on fixed incomes, oppose the austerity measures that the EU would impose on Ukraine, and others, like industrial workers, understood that joining the customs union would maintain trade ties with Russia and other post-Soviet states, and therefore preserve jobs and preserve the status quo. So this is a, <clears throat> this we've heard before, it's a crucial goal since Donbass is obviously dominated by Soviet era mining, metallurgy, and machine building industries that are less competitive on European markets. This second um, quote here is from Pavel Gubarov, who is a founder of the DNR and a pro-Russia advocate. And in an interview um, in, Rush, in Russia, with a Russian interviewer, when asked directly about why people support separatism, he suddenly shifted from discussing the Russian ethnic and historical elements of Novorossiya and began discussing the calculations of workers. And he said, in, in the manufacturing sector, everyone very clearly understands why the factory motor siege stopped working. It stopped because Russia's not buying. Of course, people understand that if Zaporizhia is not pro-Russian, then they'll be out of jobs, and that's thousands of employees. Interestingly, the choice in favor of the custom union, customs union mimicked one of the enormously popular goals of the 1994 autonomy movement in Donbass, which was full integration with the CIS Economic Union, and, which was voted for by 89% of the population in Donetsk and 91% in Luhansk in a popular referendum. Okay, Berkut. One of the ways that the Maidan gave rise to a sense of betrayal and alienation among residents in Donbass concerns the Berkut. Rakut was founded in 1990 as an elite force to manage crowd control and fight organized crime. And obviously everyone knows uh, Yanukovych used it to violently subdue Maidan protesters. And Rakut, as a result, were labeled violent criminals. But in Donbass, they were perceived to be loyally executing their duties. The reputation of the Rakut held special significance for Donbass since many of the troops came from Donetsk. And this is a situation that recalls um, many instances of ethnic violence or ethnic conflict in which the police are dominated by a particular ethnic group 
for example, the Yugoslav National Army in Yugoslavia, which, which was dominated by Serbs. At demonstrations in April, mothers stood in front of the crowd holding pictures of their sons who were killed and, or wounded while the crowds chanted Berkut. Um, and here's, here's a quote from um, um, uh, a member of, uh, a sympathizer, a member of Berkut. Um, we had a country and now we don't. The whole of Ukraine couldn't care less about the East. Are we citizens or not? They insult our compatriots. They are heroes and we're cattle. Working cattle to contribute to the budget. Okay, Russian language. This is a, a more complicated story. The status of the Russian language became a very popular subject at separatist rallies following Yanukovych's departure. And I'll just <clears throat> look at the fourth line, the yellow. Uh, this, these are some mentions of Russian language rights or Russian culture. This is before Yanukovych um, was, you know, was left, and this is after. You can see much more frequently became a subject at the, at the protests. Yet polls from the same period show extremely low concern with the issue among some Russian speakers in Donetsk and Luhansk. Only 9.4% and 12.7% of respondents in these two oblasts um, <clears throat> said that they were very, um, said that language made them, um, made them most an anxious most of all. And uh, this, this, this data point is confirmed by an IRI poll that also showed low um, concern with language issues. These polls, furthermore, took place after the Ukrainian parliament's attempt to annul the 2012 language law passed under Yanukovych that allowed Russian official regional language status. So this contradiction between poll results and demonstrators' demands for Russian language rights, as well as other research by scholars of Ukrainian politics, suggests that it's not ethno-cultural differences in and of themselves that motivated support for separatism among Russophones, but the way that political leaders use language to try to define and divide the Russian-speaking and Ukrainian-speaking populations from each other. Um, even if residents in the East did not believe that Russia, Russian was under threat, the action of Ukraine's new leaders immediately after taking power sent a strong signal that Kiev was at a minimum disregarding the Russophone um, population. Okay, ultra-nationalist discourse. Finally, one of the most important ways which events event which, uh, in which events of Maidan generated alienation among Donbass residents concerns the new government's perceived embrace of Ukrainian ultranationalism. The ethnically exclusivist view of Ukrainian nationhood that characterized one strand of political discourse in Ukraine for years was perceived by many in the East to have its moment during Maidan. Following the critical role played by Svoboda and right sector at Maidan, Ukraine's new government failed to criticize the xenophobic discourse that scapegoated ethnic Russians for Ukraine's problems, um, and instead you know, appointed a, a former leader of a neo-fascist party to lead the National Security Defense Council, a move that was uh, you know, reversed pretty quickly. But anxiety about Ukrainian ultranationalism was evident in many statements made by separatist demonstrators. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna uh, read all of this, but it was uh, commonly expressed um, uh, by, by participants and leaders or people who would come to the front and speak at the demonstrations. So as Kudelia has argued, fear radicalized residents of Donbass who witnessed nationalist paramilitary groups violently seizing buildings and battling police at protests throughout Ukraine. As one young man speaking at a rally on February 22nd stated, right sector's just a bunch of fascists who trained for 10 years and didn't have anywhere to direct their rage. They're just pieces of meat to them. Right sector said that they want to destroy all of East Ukraine and make us their slaves. So to conclude, this, this analysis suggests that there were a range of reasons why people who supported separatism in Donbass did so, rather than a grand unifying grievance or an identity-based motivation. So while some supporters of separatism have maintained Soviet-era identities and political loyalties since 1991, others were motivated by more recent considerations of material interest or a sense of betrayal stemming from the events of Maidan. Thus, the label pro-Russian only captures part of the story and may be misleading in that it suggests that Ukrainians and Donbass have fixed preferences in favor of secession or that they're receptive to and therefore easily manipulated by Russian propaganda, a subject that needs more research. Uh, um, and in conclusion, the analysis here attempts to return agency to residents who supported separatism. Thank you.
thank you, Elise, for that uh, very nuanced presentation that I'm sure will uh, motivate uh, some questions. Um, for another very nuanced presentation on the other side of the timeline of the, uh, of the Ukraine conflict and the politics surrounding it, uh, we have Alexander Kazun from Kharkiv National University, uh, who will be speaking on the formal and informal in Ukraine's neo-patrimonial democracy. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Euromaidan revolution resulted in the collapse of the super-presidential regime of Viktor Yanukovych and opened the way to fast political and economic reforms towards a more pluralistic democratic political system. In spring 2014, Ukraine returned to the 2004 premier presidential constitution that significantly limited presidential powers in favor of prime minister and member of parliamentary coalition. After October 2014 uh, parliamentary election, the majority of seats uh, were taken by pro-European uh, democratic parties that formed a new ruling coalition composed of the Pips Front of Arsenia Yatsenyuk, Petro Poroshenko Bloc, Radical Party of Oleg Yashko, Samopomish led by uh, Mayor of Lviv, Andriy Sadavi, uh, and Batkivshin of Yulia Timoshenko. What has changed and remained the same in the Ukrainian politics? Beyond that, the political regime become more democratic and open to an improved competition, absence of dominant party of power, and emergence of new center of political influence, like a young political parties, for example, Samopomich or Andriy Sadevi, radical party of Leshko and other, the rise of civic activism, NGO and third sector, emergence of voluntary battalion movement. On the other hand, the patrimonial nature of political regime is organized its organizing principles and function remain the same. Informal institutions continue to dominate the former, and clan patron ties, personal loyalty, and membership in certain clan relatives are, and business partners still, still persist as organizing principles of the system. The patrimonial principles determine the formation of political parties, the majority of public office appointments and structuring relations political actors and national and regional levels. These patrimonial ties, oddly enough, contributed to the fixation of political competition in a series of formal and informal power sharing arrangements between Poroshenko and Klitschko in Vienna, Vien, uh, and Poroshenko and Yatsenyuk after the October 2015 elections. Uh, the series of informal arrangements allowed Poroshenko to secure the support of the moderate fraction of the former party of power like Firtash and Bevochkin group in the party of region, but also through a tandem with Yatsenyuk helped marginalize the party avant-garde of the Euromaidan radicals, Freedom Party Svoboda, and its leader uh, Oleg uh, Tyagnibok. A political regime that emerged in 2015-2000 uh, in 2015 may be defined as a neo-patrimonial democracy in which rent-seeking is a key driver of politics. Political actors compete through formal electoral mechanism for the presidential office and seats in parliament, but their goals still, still focus on state capture as a primary gain. Ukraine politics in the first of the all uh, is a struggle of different patron clients or oligarchic networks to gain a controlling presidential position over the distribution of resources. Political parties are formed by political investors, not to protect the interest of electorate, but to promote quota-based distribution of rent-seeking position in cabinet of ministers and uh, principal state corporation. For the effective implementation of the reform uh, pol uh, policies, uh, President Poroshenko should resolve several issues related to the formal rules of competition uh, in Ukrainian presidential system and to the peculiarities uh, of party competition un under the dominance of informal institution and informal rule. The key issue from, the, from this, uh, this uh, standpoint, I believe, is that to transform a premier from the president's political rival into his ally at minimum and his party representative at maximum. For the accomplishment of this task, three components of Poroshenko's strategy that he consistently follows after the, his election in May 2015 are important. Uh, the first one is the building a large presidential party capable of securing at least a relative majority in a parliamentary election. The strategy for building a presidential party is based on the patronage and clientelism as well 
uh, the inclusion of influential regional businessmen in the president's client petro network. Apart from this, a crucial element of the presidential party formation is the absorption of other parties. At the end of August uh, 2015, Poroshenko's Solidarity Party de facto absorbed Klitschko's UDA. At the same time, Yatsenyu People's Front refused to participate in local elections in October uh, 2015, agreeing to coordinate its candidate nomination with Piotr Poroshenko bloc. Uh, many consider Alexander Turchinov to be the main driver behind the merge between Petro Poroshenko bloc and the People's Front. The second uh, one is control over regional elites, some of which treat their region as a patrimonial domain, watching and even have their own paramilitary forces. Therefore, a crucial, crucial element of the constitutional reform for Poroshenko and uh, decentralization policy is the establishing of the president's representative institution, so-called prefect, uh, to control local regional balance. Regional elites' integration into the sphere of presidential influence is also realized through the patronage of regional party projects capable of uniting and organizing the local self-government's people into the party structure, structure allied to the president. For example, Nash Krai party that include many members of former party of region who could uh, not enter Piotr Poroshenko block directly, and People's Control, uh, Narodny Control Party of Dmitro Dabardolo that tries to take words from Andrisa Davisa Mapomich. The, uh, the third one is uh, restraining oligarchs' political influence by under undermining their economic resource base, base. The key role here belongs to the conflict between President Poroshenko and influential Ukrainian oligarch Igor Kolomoisky, who was one of the few oligarchs to support the Euromaidan revolution. The conflict escalated in spring 2015 uh, when Poroshenko tried to remove Kolomoisky top managers from the state corporation Uk Transnafta and Uk Nafta. After Kolomoisky began to use his private army in the uh, Kyiv downtown to protect his oil assets, he was dismissed from the position of governor of Dnipropetrovska Oblast. Shortly after these events, Igor Palitsa, who was also a member of Kolomoisky Client Patrol Network and governor of Odessa Oblast, uh, was fired too. Kolomoisky gradual removal from the rent sources and state corporations substantially undermined his economic influence, but did not destroy his political role based on Kolomoisky ownership of the leading one-to-one -one TV channel and active investment in, into his own political project. Apart from the Ukrop party, Kolomoisky sponsors a parallel regional political party with Georgia, informally led by Vitaly Hamutinik. The party involves many local elite representatives linked to Kolomoisky and, similar to Nash Krai of uh, Petro Poroshenko, targets former party of region electorate in the eastern and southern part of the Ukraine. And uh, one can outline several scenarios of the political system evolution after the local elections in October 2015. Uh, first uh, one, the configuration of the existing pro-European coalition in the parliament through a search of new coalition partner who can continue the democracy relationship between the president and the premier. If the negotiation of the absorption of the people's front by Petro Poroshenko bloc succeed, and a new power party of power emerges, then Alexander Turchina will have a good ch chance to, to become a new prime minister. If the negotiations fail, then a more radical variant of the alliance between Petro Poroshenko bloc and Batkivshina is possible. In fact, a model of Poroshenko as a president and Timoshenko as a prime minister is a, a replication of the Kyiv Dnipropetrovsk tandem in the era of Kuchma, which Lazarenko is the premier, and uh, the er era of Yushchenko under the premiership of Timoshenko. The second, set, uh, second uh, scenario, if a split, of bit, uh, split between Petro Poroshenko bloc and the People's Front on the one hand, and Samopomich and Batyvshina on the other hand, will lighten, then the scenario of the de facto grand coalition involving the opposition bloc is possible. Uh, it should be noted that the political history of the Ukraine knows the cohabitation uh, of president and premiers from uh, different political camps, for example, the Yushchenko government under the president Kuchma and Yanukovych government under the president Yushchenko. 
the third scenario. In the case of successful party of power formation around President uh, Bloch of Petro Poroshenko, a transition to a particular model of managed democracy is possible. Under this type of regime, the de controlling of national demo uh, bureaucracy and re regional elites is made through they join the party of power. At the same time, control over local self-governance is realized by the president's prefects. If the president's party wins uh, at least a relative majority in the parliament, there is no further need uh, for a powerful coalition partner. Thus, the formation of technical government with a tenure from president close circle be 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 becomes possible. Potential candidates for this role can be Mikhail, Sak Mikhail Saakashvili, Boris Loshkin, Igor Kononenko, and Vladimir Roisman. This scenario reminds us, uh, uh, reminds us of such tandems as Kuchma, Pustavoytenko, Yushchenko, Yehanurov, Yanukovych, Azarov, in which the primers were themselves members of presidential party and were the technical premiers. Uh, Fourth scenario, if political contradiction in the par parliament proliferate, a union of all political forces against Poroshenko and a certain variant of oligarchic counter-revolution is possible. Uh, this process could be driven by Kolomoisky political projects such as Ukrop political party and Vidrojenia group joined by other discontented oligarchs like Akhmetov, Firtash and Lovachkin. Apart from Ukrop, Ukrop and majoritarian deputies from the Vidrojenia and uh, uh, Volya Naroda, a hypothetic anti-presidential coalition may be enlarged by opposition bloc, and if premiership is guaranteed for her by Kivshin of Yulia Tymoshenko. Uh, a new parliamentary coalition around oligarchic parties sponsored by Kolomoisky and Akhmetov and the appointment of a premier subordinate to them can undermine Poroshenko's position, limit his formal and informal influence over key appointments at the national and regional level, and in prospect may result in extraordinary uh, early party presidential elections. Finally, uh, Conclusion, uh, paradoxically, the Ukrainian post-Maidan neo-patrimonial democracy fosters the creation of both formal premier presidential system and informal competition between several uh, centers of influence, limitation to development of super-presidential regime and transition to a regime of personal rule. On the other hand, uh, formal competition rules in the premier presidential republic hinder the state capture by the representatives of the oligarchy groups and monopolization of political space uh, by only one a political and economic clan. The political pact of 2015 has led to institutional competition between the president and premier. Additionally, the co-optation co of other partners, but Kishina, Samakomich, and radical party in the coalition with Petro Poroshenko bloc and Pips front of uh, Arseniy Yatsenyuk resulted in more intensive competition and better uh, democratic accountability in the country. Thank you.